All right, today we are we're diving into a topic uh, that has a lot of uh, that sort of goes away in the off season, but rears its head uh, every March and April as guys return from uh, from the off season, and that's pitching injuries. Uh, so we're going to get into some of the common reasons for for pitching injuries. Uh, what's been tried, you know, maybe what has not been tried, what are some potential solutions on the, on the horizon for things like this? And then, uh, and then honestly, just like, it seems like we've been talking about this for, you know, 15, 20 years at this point, just like, why, why is this not solved? Like, why is this still a problem? You know, and this is Jeff Passan wrote the arm, uh, you know, almost 10 years ago at this point, yep. you know, highlighting the, the crisis and, uh, we're still here. Unfortunately, it's a great book still. You know, you would, yeah, no, right. it'd be great if it was a bad book, you know, and like, oh, it's a historical relic. That's right. And it is that. It's great. Um, I think the chapter on Japan is really worth reading because it dispels a lot of those myths, you know. So I'm not going to spoil it and talk about that. But get it. Get a copy of it. Be cheap. Um, unfortunately, a lot of it still applies today. You know? Yeah. I mean, like yeah. the chapters on Hudson were really good, too. Mm-hmm. Daniel Hudson, oh, no. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Going, going sure. through his his struggles coming back from from surgery, but I guess like the, you know, I think just to, to summarize or to, you know, to sort of like take the, take the, you know, the, the problem in, in the aggregate, what do you guys think are some of the, are the most common cited reasons for this and sort of your own personal takes on this? I'll give like a more general overview and turn it over for the more micro thing. There was a great article by Michael Rosen on fan graphs the other day about uh about this topic and i always call it out when i see it um he sourced the hell out of the article you know and i really appreciate them these journalists work their ass off you know it's like got a a zillion sources from mlb training facilities adam blowbomb here at driveline you know and it's just like man i want to give a shout out because the article is high quality so there's that but you know even if it's not that amount of work that goes into sourcing it is, is really impressive especially about a topic that's that's this serious you know so i wanted to to shout it out because I know how much work goes into that. Um, now, he wrote that article. For those who haven't read it, we'll you know, include it in the, in the show notes or anything, but you definitely should check it out. Uh, it just talks about how maybe all this biomechanical optical data that's being collected through Kinetrax and Hawkeye uh, at the league level at MLB and some in college, if there was a way to anonymize it, you know, release it, just like PitchFX was, uh, maybe open source people could get more eyes on it and solve or at least make a dent in the injury thing. And I think that it's definitely good natured. You know, my responses to the article, you can find on my Twitter, uh, but we're a lot like, you know, the players union is going to have very real concerns about the privacy and they should. And um, it's, you know, the approach to solving this problem or making a dent in it is going to be multimodal. You know, it's not going to just be mechanics. Bad mechanics don't cause injuries on on their own, you know, and, and part, we don't even know, how large of a contributor it is. That's the biggest problem where we're at. We don't even know the scope. We don't know the coefficients of all the, of all the inputs, you know, and I think that's what we need to start with before we even start tackling how bad are your mechanics and like, how much does that hurt you? You know, like um, that's, that's, that's tough. So at driveline, you know, we, we take a really holistic view, a very multimodal view of it. And um, you know, Whitey's going to talk a little bit about that, about how I'm really passionate about exploring the biometric side of it, the readiness uh, monitoring and, and some of the initiatives we're, we're working on. So, well, so, but if it is, if it is multimodal, let's talk about the modals. Oh yeah. All yeah. Right. So, all right. So you've got, you know, mechanics or, or biomechanics, yep. but yep. like what, what else are the contributing factors? And I, I'd, I'd like to take that breakdown from a, from a different perspective. Cause like when we're talking about injury, like base is like load exceeded capacity. Like something happened that that part of the body wasn't ready to do. That's like, but then your the the impact exceeded the shatter capacity of your leg, and yep. so you have a broken leg now. Yep. Yeah. Um, and but where the multimodal comes in is like how those break down. Like acute, chronic, workload, impact. Um, is the injury something that was like slowly whittling away? Is it something that one off like a, a collision in, in a sport like football or something like that mm-hmm. where somebody's knee just gets buckled it was fine something bad happened it was not um and the the blending of those things but those those are pretty easy to conceptualize like on the how the injury happened side on the the load side but on the the capacity side is really where the like the training part of that comes in right and so the those different parts between the acute to chronic and those break down into the different tissue types the nervous system regulation 
everything that's going into that that player's state at the at the moment of the pitch, the season, like narrow view, wide view, um, goes into that that capacity side of it. And so quantifying those things in terms of like the the efficiency of how they're of how they're moving and accepting those loads, how they're um, their what that load is relative to like the the total like if you're thinking about it like simply looking at like our assessment your peak force from the mid dive pole your explosive force from the jumps how much can you do total how much can you do quick every piece of connective tissue tendons ligaments muscles bones even everything is going to have those same like load limits rate limits everything like that with how quick can it accept these things how much can it do total how frequently can it do it so quantifying each of these different steps and then preparing the body accordingly is the the capacity side of that equation because we can't control we can control some of these things through pitch counts um monitoring the readiness those kind of things like going into outings um but going into the like the preparation is more on the capacity side the load is like the regulation so so then i guess like if if we're thinking about just like how that how that breaks down for a standard population of players because I, I think what what i'm hearing you say is like there are so many variables that go into what makes a player good what makes a player bad what makes a player hurt what makes a player healthy like there's so many variables that at least at this point in time it's been very difficult for us to quantify that uh and and so I guess my, my question is just like, um, there have to be some prime movers in there of like, like, yeah, hydration probably like plays a part, but how much of a role, you know, like, whereas like something like mechanics or some of these other things might have like a greater coefficient or a greater likelihood of, of like making you sort of good or bad, like. When, when you think about all the different variables, are there things that break down to like, these are the big things that we're trying to, to look at? From, from like an overhead view, I think one, like the, the really simple way we can look at it is using like our, our expected velocity metric, like that saying like, is the body's force capacity product, or force production capacity in line? How does that compare with the actual velocity that they're producing? Now we often look at that more for like training insight, like identifying an athlete's lowest hanging fruits, but it's mm -hmm. also, I think really valuable from that, that perspective, um, in that we're saying that if this athlete's expected velocity is 91 and he's throwing 96, it tells us like, okay, this athlete's skill goes beyond their, their physical capacity, mm -hmm. like the technicals ahead of the physical. Um, but that also means that the, the technical is putting the body in a position that the physical might not be there for. So for those, that's part of the, the answer on like, why, why does that kind of thing matter to somebody who's so skilled that the two are going to have, um, that big, like residual or the, the gap between them, um, is that that's like, that's the floor. That's what you're prepared for. Mm -hmm. Um, like I'd say like, I'm a good example now, like I don't throw regularly anymore. If I go hop up and sling a gray ball, the peak velocity is still going to be pretty good, but I can tell you that the units going into that are not prepared for, for what they're going to happen. And I'm going to be at a greater injury risk and I'm going to be a lot more sore mm -hmm. at, there afterwards. Um, because that, that floor, that capacity is no longer where the, the skill can get the output to. And we kind of see this in rehab, the smart teams are moving towards, you know, once it's already happened, right. So we're talking about post injury, but we can learn a lot from that, right. Which is, you know, using a velocity model when it's throwing, hey, the, the radar gun and the radar border out there, and that's a speed limit sign, like truly <laughs> the use of a radar gun. Yep. And we're, we understand this from a rehab. So after something terrible has happened, we now know don't exceed this limit, right? And whether it's biomechanical, you know, pulse, which arm speed, which is great. Um, and really, I think really important at low velocities, right? But then once we start getting to 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, using it as a speed limit sign, you know, we kind of transition from this wearable to a velocity output or both. And we understand this, you know, it's, it's generally accepted in, in, in the medical community and in physical therapy that this is, this is the new model for return to throw. Like it's been very well accepted. Many major league teams are using the model that, that we pioneered, honestly. Um, and we're happy for that. And the results have been awesome. You know, we've heard from, I mean, you've heard from the people, you know, a lot of them. Um, so we know that, 
but then it comes right. to, then it's like oh hey uh, you're healthy all right we just put that in the box and hopefully we don't open it again you know it's like well you know we probably should be paying attention to that um now when you're throwing 98 and whatever it's not there's no speed limit sign that's not how it works people would like that you know and that's what we're talking about like oh we should limit velocity or how to do all this other stuff and it's like that's just directly at odds with incentives you know so that's not going to work um, the incentive in rehab is to get out of it so the speed limit is part of the incentive mm -hmm. but then when you're trying to get out you know mike trout yeah, the incentive is that, not anything else. Uh, but that doesn't mean we can't control some of those things like like Whitey's talking about. I mean, both Whitey and I are wearing aura rings. Um, and, and you could just chart it yourself a big part of a reason. And shout out to the Cincinnati Reds, you know, who the trial program. You know, when we did a basic readiness test on um, the readiness scores, the sleep scores, something very coarse. You know, I did some a basic machine, you know, uh, machine learning model. Um, players above a certain readiness were way more likely to have stuff plus breakouts and, and pitch better. And below it, all, the majority, you know, the plurality of our injuries fell in the, in those buckets. So it's like, there's just no doubt that readiness is a big factor. And I've charted my accuracy, like playing chess and tournament things. Like when my readiness score is good and I'm sleeping and everything like that, I, I play significantly better. Like mm -hmm. You can test these things. Right. And so we just need to factor that in. It's something we do at driveline and we're folding into track and our AMS and, and, becoming more automated. Uh, we can get to the more advanced stuff that we're doing, but there's just no doubt that there's a way to track it. Uh, and with the advances of AI and large language models becoming easier and easier to use, I mean, you can ask, you know, we're not going to have to talk about it, but why is shipping a major, you know, thing in our app? And, you know, because of enabled these great tools, there's, there's never been a better time to start looking into this and uh, consumers to be kind of attacking this problem. I guess one, one question that when, when these sorts of things come up, right? Like, people obviously point to velocity as like a big predictor for, for injury risk. And then they obviously point to like bad mechanics or, you know, like doing things improperly. Um, but then a lot of times they point to like, Hey, these kids are just like selling out for Velo way early and, or they're like early careers are poorly managed or whatever. Um, but like, is it, it's not reasonable to ask an 11 year old to wear an aura ring. Like we are, we are not there yet. Not, Put aside, I guess, who, who am I to ask you what is reasonable? But like, <laughs> but like. I've been doing it for 15 years now. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just We've saying been fighting that, that battle. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not likely that we're going to be seeing that, uh, you know, adopted at scale. Even if, I think even if you came out tomorrow and you were like, provably every 11 year old that wears an aura ring every day and monitors their sleep tracking for, you know, the next whatever, 20 years of their life will never be injured and reach their genetic ceiling. I'm not sure that parents are signing up for that. No, no, they're not. So, so then like, you know, it is, do you guys think the, the early usage thing is, is like a, a big issue or like certainly contributing to what we're seeing at like the upper ends of the sport in college and pro? I, th I think it is. Um, but it's gotten a lot better. I think we have to admit that it's gotten a lot better over the last 20, 30 years, you know? So my, has it over oh, 30 years? Oh, for sure. I mean, like dude, Jace Fry threw like back to back CGs, 210 pitches on a Friday and a Saturday. Like we don't do that anymore. You know, like as much as Devin posts those things, that's not happening. Like he did it in like a big national tournament and everyone's like, yeah, all right. You know, it's like, sure. Some backwater field, that might happen. Sure. But I mean, he did it at a national showcase and everyone's like, oh, that guy's a dog. But Jace <laughs> Fry wasn't 30 years ago. Jace Fry, no, but Jace Fry doing that was. And it's longer than you want to admit. Yeah, I know. It's 30, yeah, I know. <laughs> like, he was in college. So that must have been what, 2009? Yeah. It's yeah. like 15 years ago. Yeah. I, I'm just, but I think, it's, it's, I think, I think, I think the height of people doing ridiculous shit was like 15, it was like yeah. 10 to 20 years ago. Yeah. that's. I mean, but it, it has gotten a lot better and we are seeing. Improve, but my, my always concern is like, I, I, I guess like, the reason I push back on the 30 years yeah. is like prior 30 years ago, there was not a huge like travel ball thing. That's true. like in That's true. whatever in yeah, it was just 1994. Starting. Yeah. It wasn't like, let's go to my big yeah. travel ball tournament and then yeah. watch Jordan take on the Pistons. Yeah. Legion ball, <laughs> you know? Legion ball was still dominating, you know? Um, but I, I just inherently, I don't like blaming someone else for the, for our problems, you know? And, and a lot of it comes off that way. They're like, oh, they're, they're screwed up before they even get to us, so we don't have to try. You know, I really hate that approach, you know. There's no doubt that it's true, uh, but it's, it's not, let's not act like what we're doing at the pro level, at the advanced level, once we get them at that older age, that, that we're doing, like, the best job ever, and you know. So I, that's, the only, that's the only thing I push back on because things have improved. You know, MLB's pitch smart, 
we both know how much we well, we actually don't know. We, we know a little bit about the people that are involved and how much work it went into it. I can only imagine it must be like a hundred times more work than, than I think it was. And people can criticize this, that, the other, but it's like, you know, the league office, the premier league in baseball took a stand, published things, put a ton of money and resources behind it and published guidelines. I mean, that's really impressive. And uh, for as many faults as it has or this, that, or the other, um, I think it's awesome what the league did. And there's no doubt that those guidelines are helping for sure. If people adhere to them, of course, that's, that's another, sure. that's another part. Um, so we're making progress. Um, so I think at the younger level, how can we increment the pitch smart guidelines, not replace them? I think, how can we improve them slightly? And there's been grants that have been approved, you know, driveline's part of this on how we can track things like uh, velocity and workload in a more granular way instead of pitch counts. We now know that pitch counts aren't the best tool and they're prop they're not useless, but, what pitch counts do is they they are the easiest available tool and they prevent the biggest abuse. Yeah, so that's that's what and that's what they were intended to do, right? It's to not like clear, someone. Yeah the, yeah, the guidelines guidelines are most effective when you have like the obvious Jace Fry level of just like and not even that because like that maybe that's a high school tournament, but like that's happening or was for like eleven year olds, and it's like yep. that's obviously dumb. Yeah, I and, threw I threw two hundred plus pitches at age 12 once you know, right again yeah and it's just like all right so that gives us an ability now to just like point up at a thing and yep. be like you sh shouldn't do that whereas before it was just an argument exactly now it's like well no i have i have this whole thing yep. on my side and it's and it's stamped by c league you know man yep. like this is where it's coming from and that's what it was intended to do so I, a lot of people take it out of context to say oh well it didn't solve injury this it's like no it was intended purely to prevent the insane abuse of like the Jays Fry, Alex White, Kerry Wood, like type of stuff. Sure. And it, it is very successful in that regard. Now, in the program, we've taken it way too far, and that's another discussion. But it's intended to target the youth level, and it's had a really good success. And we can argue, well, there should be a centralized database of pitch counts or this, that, the other. Now we're starting to attack the margins. I don't think that's right. I think we should evolve Pitch Smart to have a wearable computer vision stuff that's cheap it's an iphone people hang a gopro on the on the fence all the time anyway with parents how do we make that possible to give very imprecise like you know not valid whatever information but it increments pitch smart how do we get to the next step sure and i think that's what driveline can really help with you think so like because i, I do think i do think that the 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 youth piece is, is largely about education like we yes. we have we have, you know, run a, a youth academy here for the last five years. Uh, we have zero UCL injuries. Like it can be done. You can play a competitive tournament schedule and not have pitching injuries and still try to train them for velocity. Like yeah, we have players, plenty of guys throwing hard. Devin our players gain velocity yeah. uh, and and we haven't had any injuries at, at that level. So it can be done. But then again, like an overwhelming amount of attention is paid by Devin and crew to, you know, ensuring that that outcome happens. Um, and we have the benefit of like a ton of extra stuff that is not available to just like mom and dad, which right. is why, uh, you know, the idea that, that somebody would just like, like the idea of even, I mean, I'm as deep as you possibly can be in this stuff. And I would never buy an aura ring for my son. No. Even if he was like, I'm going to be the next Carrie Wood. <laughs> no, but to take the AI thing, I know people are sick of it, but um, so much like the biggest models, right? The biggest, most expensive models you can buy, right? They're awesome, but they're impractical. Like you're going to have to run something on your phone, right? Apple understands this extremely well, right? It's not good. You're not always going to have internet access. It has to be available. It has to be powered by your phone. Well, your phone has a terrible processor in it. It's, it's super slow. doesn't have a lot of memory in it, but Apple knows that they're going to ship AI in every phone that doesn't require the internet, Right. So the point is to have the most expensive, most crazy, cost billions of dollars to train model, and then you distill it, that's what they call it, into smaller models. Well, these models are worse. They're imprecise. They suck. Well, why do we, why, why do we use them? It's like, well, the point is that they work in, oper in areas where the large, expensive model can't work. That's the thing. And, yeah. that's, and that's not just AI. That's everything. So driveline, we're distilling our launch pads have cost millions of dollars to build, right? Not just in equipment, but the labor that went into it and the refactoring we've done, and we're going to distill it down to the track app. And yeah, that's not as good as the gold standard, but that's not what we're measuring it against. Can we increment, can we make progress? And that's what I'm most excited to work on. It's what we've been focusing on over the last really year and a half. Like, you yeah. know, 
like get the products in front of the people, distill it down into a usable thing um, because we're not trying to build, you know, a faster car. We're trying to build the worst airplane, right? And a pretty good bike. Like we got to attack both sides of it. And uh, that's what excites me, you know, is, is, is shipping something slightly imprecise, but way better than what exists already. And, uh, and we're really close to doing that. And I know Whitey's working a ton on that too. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the youth, the youth segment is, is plagued by this sort of like, you know, we're improperly using that and, and, and whatever, but it still remains that like chronic overuse or, or underuse or just misloading, like you were talking about Whitey is, uh, is, is a factor like what, what are the, what are the potential inter interventions on, on something like that? Yeah. And what, what kind of success have we been having? You know, Mike's talked about the injuries, lack thereof, the performance, no, no lack thereof of that, which has been great. What kind of goes into that base layer and then, and then the intervention piece on top of that? I think really, and, and I think that's the, the, com the main component of why like the Academy does so well with that, that like risk return ratio of like, like you said, no UCL injuries people are throwing a lot harder um, is just the like periodization of those things. Cause yeah. if we're talking like stress recovery adaptation, if we're, if all we're doing is we have a little leaguer throw a hundred pitches and then his arm hurts. So then he throws another hundred pitches five days later and he's just going through that cycle. He's just going to get good at throwing a hundred pitches um, and then being ready to do so five days later. But the, the tasks that we're, we're optimizing around are long-term athletic development. So then they're, they're focused, they're playing games in the weight room, they're learning fundamental movement patterns, they're being challenged on ways on the skill side where they're, they're throwing different balls, they're hitting different balls, they're swinging different implements. Um, so the, not just like the training styles are like the holistic perspective, but the, like the goals are, are centered around like where are we trying to get to, not around like um, the, the immediate task at hand. So like the task at hand is used for the goal, the goal isn't the task at hand. Me meaning like we're just not trying to like go out and like win a bunch of tournaments. Yeah. That the idea is like, yeah, we'll win tournaments like when you're 16 and 18. And the big rebuttal of this though is, oh, that's boring. The kids don't like it. You know, they're, they're not, no, they want to do that. But I mean, I go out there in the intended zone and the gamification, of what we, it doesn't feel like they find it boring, right? Right. Definitely. I mean, the like you said, the gamification is is huge and you're putting rather than just like the the concept of getting better at baseball it's um, reach, jump this much higher, swing this much harder, hit the ball this much further. Um, the, the intended zone thing, huge, right? Because you're putting, you're, you're gamifying, you're quantifying. It's not just like the thumbs up, thumbs down from your pitching coach on how your, your command was that day. It's a tangible marker of progress where you're, you're trying to do something that's improving you for the larger goal. You're not just like ambiguously setting out to become a better baseball player. Um, you're, you're setting individualized goals that achieving them contribute to that. And the catchers so. are all liars. I mean, you were yeah. one, you know, and then the frame a liar or a catcher, <laughs> both, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, both, uh, the, the best catchers are liars, you know, and they're, the framing revolution is, is here and arguably past, you know, it's just, you have to do it now. Yeah. And they're so good at lying about that. Um, because that's good. That's their job. They're supposed to gas up the pitcher, fool the umpires there. And they're all being trained at a young age to do that one knee down framing. There's no doubt that it, it's the right way to go. Um, but paradoxically, that makes it harder for the pitcher to command the ball, you know, like at the younger age, develop it because they think they're dialing it in. And a, a great story that I've always, I know you love this one. I think, I think you know about it, but uh, when Casey Weathers was on Team USA and he was thrown to a noted framing expert before his time, Taylor Teagarden. Yeah. You know, and he's throwing and he pitches in a game in the Olympics, I think, and he's die and he like punches out the side. And he's like, I was, die I was nasty. It was incredible. And he goes and he talks to T Garden. He's like, dude, that was incredible. I was dotting T Garden's like, you were not. <laughs> like he's like, and he's like, oh, that's how good Taylor is. Like, that's he's like, he makes it feel that way, you know. But like, that's not helping him develop. No, that's sure. the Olympics. He's trying to win gold for his country, no doubt. That's 100%. fine. There's a time and a place for that. But then also Taylor's like, dog, I mean, come on, I'm just a man, you know. <laughs> like, so the intended zone is a is a cold, it's frustrating for the first couple times, but the kids they got it. They love it because it's like, yeah, it's frustrating, but it's a video game to them. Am I getting a little bit better at this? I'm a little bit better at this. And that's Fortnite. That's anything else they play. That's exactly how it's presented to them. Um, and so as a result, like we, we see a lot of success. I've seen a ton. Of, I know the jumps are the same way. They see the number, they see this and everything's in track and, and it's, and it's reported to them like, Hey, you're getting better at these things, worse at these things. How do we manage this? And I mean, that's the way for it. That's the way, not only is it the most efficient way and effective way to help players. That's great. 
Um, but as uh, someone we both know at a very high at a very high position in baseball, um, he would always say, uh, "It's not enough to be right." He's like, "That that's that's a given. We're smart. We're supposed to be right." He's like, "Can we get the other party to buy in to what we're, we're selling?" You know, and uh, that's what I think is so exciting about our approach. Uh, I don't think we set out to be the most engaging. Certainly, it's always been on our mind, but it turns out that the way that we approach it kind of naturally was that way. Now we've had to make tweaks to make it more engaging. But I would say 80% of the base layer just is engaging to the youth athlete, which is really exciting to me. We don't have to compromise on much. Yeah. And and then there's there's the other component, which is like we pay a lot of attention to like, hey, if you're if you're not in compliance with a lot of the stuff that we're trying to do, then like you just can't do the stuff that puts you at risk. And the challenge with that is that like then you just end up like forfeiting a game on a Sunday or you don't have your best guy available or you don't have, you know, your, your third guy. And so then you're just pitching, you know, some guys and that means you lose some games. Yeah, like, but that's a, that's a deliberate development choice. I, yeah. I did it when I was coaching Roosevelt high school. Yeah. You know, when no contact rule, I abided by the Washington state rules. Apparently no one does that, but I did, you know, don't talk to the players. Here's this optional throwing program. We had two guys who did it and we had games in two weeks. And I was like, look, I'm not going to, I told the parents, I'm like, I'm not going to put your kids arms at risk for a freshman games, you know? So the kid that did the throwing program before he was our ace, he go 90 pitches, no problem. One week rest, fine. Everyone else, I, you know, I did stuff that I wasn't even comfortable with. I'm like, we got to play these games, you know? So there was a two inning max for those guys, which yeah. arguably maybe is too much, but I'm like, I, we got to draw the line. We, we got to yeah, play yeah. the games. Yeah, you know? that's right. And so we set two inning maxes. The first 10 games, we went maybe two and eight. Last 10 games, I think we went nine and one, you know, and it's just like, look, and that, that caused those kids to buy in. They understood later. It's like, oh, and the parents initially were pretty upset, uh, but they understood that I had their kids, you know, you know, arms at, in my mind. Um, and then in the second half, they're like, oh, not only does Kyle feel this way, but like, actually it might be the better way to, to do this, even if he didn't care about their arms. Like, maybe this is just the better way to develop, you know, and it was a really cool transition in that line. The 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 argument around the around the youth baseball like subculture is that by forcing these kids to play competitive games with like fixed innings that you're you're sort of like pulling them beyond their capacities mm. because you have this like structure that's in place over the weekend and it's like all right well we got a three game minimum that means we got to you know we're throwing 18 innings at minimum yeah and in like, high school, I, I was just trying to plan for two to three games a week. That's right. Much and less so, on the so, weekend. You know? So we got, you know, we got to, we got to cover, we got to cover these 18 plus like, God forbid we win one, you know, and then, and then we got to cover more and it's like, all right, like, you know, you might be at 40 innings by the end of the weekend that you've got to cover across a roster of 12 or roster of 15. Like if you don't, if you're not actively cultivating a ton of depth, which it's hard to do because you're like. All right, the thir who's the thirteenth best pitcher on our like fourteen U team? Like, you think he's not going to get absolutely molly whopped? <laughs> like, you know, there's right. there's no way. So it just it, it it's hard because it's like, all right, we want to we want to show up, we want to compete, we want to win, but then also like winning has these certain structures. Those structures compel you, you know, over over the limit per se. And then I think it's really hard to to turn around to a thirteen year old and be like. You want to throw 14 innings this weekend? All right. Put on your aura ring. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like get prepared. Right. And I've only coached it, so I want you to talk about it. So you played it at Pro Bowl, you know, but this, in, in a clip that went out from Driveline, I recorded here about, you know, if you're a nine year old or 11 year old, like what would you do long term? What advice would you give? You know, that was a question I answered from Twitter and I talked about it. And um, I said one of the worst things you can do is just take your kids, if their only exposure is to the big leagues, I think it's one of the worst things you can do. Because that's the innings gated. Well, we play nine innings and there's these pitchers. You get these false impressions of how the game must be played, mm -hmm. right? So take them to minor league games. Take them to semi-pro games. Take them to high school games, right? And then if you can, like, take them to spring training games and instructs, right? That's what, because, like, in instructs and spring training, you know this, having gone through it, right? Like, we don't do that. There, there's two organizations. There's one organization I won't call out, but they do. It's a professional one that they they do that. They'll make, they don't roll innings, right? And for those who don't know, rolling an inning is just like, hey, we're done. This pitcher's reached his pitch count or whatever, and, and we're, we're moving yeah. on. And uh, they'll do that even in big league, you know, spring training games in the pandemic. And they don't anymore, but they'll do them in all the normal spring training games, right? Mm -hmm. And like, so if we can accept this at the professional level, you know, but the dad who's never gone to a backfields game or, or an instructs game, he doesn't know that that's an option, right? He doesn't know at the highest level where we pay these guys millions of dollars that we treat them with kid gloves. Like we do that. 
you know, if right. all you do are go to big league games, yeah, maybe you see the position player pitch here or there, you know, whatever, but you're not seeing entire innings get locked but you're off. Not, but you're not keeping score. No, I know, but it's yeah, like, but, but you can, you're not going, you, go, you show up to a tournament, you got to, somebody's got to right. win. There's a winner sure. and there's no, a no. whole bunch of losers. Yeah. You know, and but it's like, as, you know, as the fair thing is like, you win the 14 U, whatever you don't get a bonus. You don't go, you don't become a big leaguer brother. You were know. preaching to the choir. Well, I know that, that. I'm but, just... the, but that's what I'm saying. But, <laughs> but the instructs games are closer to the tournament games than like they, people want to admit. It's like, it's all part of a development curve, you know, and not so, necessarily. I mean, that's not what people are buying. No, I, people, I totally people are that. buying. Like I show up and you know, my 15 are going to beat your 15. Yeah. We're the, yeah, I agree. We're the hottest thing smoking in, in East a fi- Arizona in a 50 game know? set. Our teams have proven that we do win, you know, like that's true. But any given weekend, we can't. We're not going to lose the battle, you know. There, we're no, not no, going to win the battle. I, I'm not. Board, I'm so. not saying that there aren't rational approaches to try to to try to navigate this like very rigid structure that dominates youth baseball at this point. What what I am saying though is that like that's not how that's not how anybody thinks, and that's not that's not what the parents of the overwhelming majority of American children are buying right now in the year of our lord 2024 i completely agree my yeah. only message is like there's other levels of baseball than the big leagues you know for sure and that's um because the parents of if you're a coach and you have kids and you, you're a pro coach you do think that way like whether you care about your kids health or like whatever it's just like no i coach instructs i know you know so no it's doubt. like our our best coaches are the highest level people get it so my message to the parents is like do they understand that so it's like you know take your kids to instruct games and not even your kids, you, you go and you understand. It's like, dude, like this is the highest level instructs and spring training is so important. And we saw this this year with some big leaders that weren't necessarily prepared who called it out. They said, you know, without spring training, I wasn't ready, you know? And so it's like, look at, at that level, they're rolling innings. They're not keeping score. They're doing this. Like, dude, that that's a player that makes 50 million a year and they still treat him. That but way. that's a, that's also, that's also a sandlot game. That's not a that's not a tournament game. You I, know what I mean? That's it's like, more just an attitude. I just think people aren't aware of that of rolling innings. That's I, it. It's I not about like, hey, we have to change these things. I'm not saying that. It's more like, hey, can the parents gain awareness of that? That's how we because if all you know is the big leagues in AAA or whatever, you may think that every game on the backfield is played that way, and that's a very reasonable assumption. We you know, but it's like we don't do that. My I, I coached my son's team this year, and he was eight, and we ran like three on three on three on three scrimmages, and that's how we ran practice was just like you have a group of three there's like kids in the outfield doing drill work and stuff and then there's outfield infield parent at first base and then a group hitting and just ripped kids through that structure and was like yeah you know i'm i'm pitching but we're just like we're rolling kids through and you get a ton of swings you get a lot of reps and then i'm gonna run that again now that it's kid pitch but it's just like innings out in like if you hit your your throw limit out if you can get 10 kids out that's great if you get zero kids out that well that's not great but you're still (laughs) out (laughs) you know like and and so that that kind of stuff can can work but it really you know it's a it's a thing that our academy teams struggle with which is like there's no there's no infrastructure for rolling a game inside of one of those tournament things and we actually forfeited a game uh you know because we just didn't have any more pitching and we didn't have any more pitching that was available we had pitching that qualified for the tournament right right but based off of our internal scoring of like how and like i mean comfort you can be you can be as on board as you want uh about that but that was still a difficult thing for the you know to be like oh wow we're gonna just like deliberately lose this game not even for the parents but like for the kids too your principles are only your principles when they're tested yeah exactly So, you know, the thing about, so what are some of, you know, the times, your time playing professional baseball and that, and how have you maybe used those experiences to, to communicate to the kids, you know, in those, in those instances, you know? I think, I think that's a, a good perspective to take is the, like, the calibration of, like, the, the goal to, to the means. Like, for me, if it was the, the last week or the, the last couple of days of, like, a, an indie ball spring training where you're getting asked to go through, through three days in a row. Or something like that and you know that probably half these guys picked up a baseball in march a month a month before this yeah and we're we're working some hourly job before that and maybe getting some swings in the cage or like throwing a bullpen or playing catch with their buddy when when they <laughs> felt right. like it um and now it's like 
your your jobs on the line and i think like obviously i was coming from a a more prepared spot than that but still there are times where you're being asked to be put in spots that you don't feel prepared for but understanding that preparation isn't just like a it's not binary it's not just like yes or no right it, it's going to be it's going to be a gradient of incremental risk that you're taking on relative to your preparation yep so i i knew in those moments that okay like if i throw today i'm probably gonna have a job if i don't throw today i'm probably not gonna have a job if i get hurt i'm probably not gonna have a job but not throwing is the same as getting hurt either way right if i'm 26 years old in an indie ball spring training the the incremental risk that i take on for not throwing versus throwing that that equation clearly says throw because if you throw and get hurt bad if you don't throw bad yep. so you at least got whatever opportunity you, you have your chance throw. yeah <laughs> that's right um that is not the case for a 12 year old right if they if they don't throw that day they're the local state school doesn't cross them off their list for a scholarship once they once they turn 17. um the the risk that they take on is is what we were just talking about of the um the the testing of like you want to compete you want to win tournaments you want to win games 100%. you don't want to forfeit games um and prioritizing like what matters the most to you as as the athlete as the parent like what is this about um and weighing those two things against each other because we're not saying like you every kid wears the aura ring we they only throw if they're in the green readiness um it's more like we're tracking these things. We're tracking the workload that they have building up. Uh, we're, we're somewhat accurately quantifying, knowing like what is what happens if he throws another game here um, and being able to weigh those two things against each other as it's the gradient, because it's not, we're not saying that if those, those pitchers went out, we know that they'd get hurt. We know that they would have a higher injury risk to do so than we feel comfortable asking them. Yep. Right. Um, and so that's where the, the measuring, the monitoring and that stuff really comes in is you're able to make educated decisions like the the wearables like the the aura isn't the decision maker it's the information provider uh you as either the athlete the parent depending on the age or the coach um that's the decision maker but having those those contextual factors those information pieces available lets the the trusted decision maker whoever that is in the chain for for that athlete um make the best decision possible for the athlete weighing the risks weighing the 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 potential benefits of the situation if the only inputs you have is how many pitches he threw yesterday and how badly do i want to win this game you're leaving a lot of information on the table for sure i think i think that's actually good good context especially for parents especially of younger athletes like shoot even collegiate athletes you know like but like there is it's it's nearly impossible to like pull pull your child back from that you know it's it's it, it's so hard and it requires burning so much like energy and parental capital to just be like no we are not doing that you know and it's like you know that stuff is is best reserved for like uh, you know i want to stick the paper clip in the electrical socket it's like no we're not doing that you know, so it's like th that it's v best reserved for these very clear, like that is obviously risky behavior that we are just definitely not doing. But for a lot of these other things, it does come down to like, do you have good quality sources of information? Like, do you do you have stuff that you can go back on that just uh, that is like, hey, we can we can think about this. We can talk about it. We can make a plan, you know, like so quality information sources as a parent is like one thing to to look at and that that could be something as simple as just like pocket radar or like some of these other things like we had a parent of uh of our of our teams here you know just like gunning guys on a on a pretty regular basis and then if we saw their velocity start to decline it was an automatic hook didn't matter if it was like he hasn't reached his pitch count limit or whatever it's like hey this guy's like 10 percent you know lower on his on his fastball velocity and for younger kids like that's a good amount of, you know, it's like, all right, like he's 77. Now he's down to like 63. Like that's, there are 70, 70 down to 63 or whatever. Like that's a good amount of, uh, a velo loss. So, you know, you could set that threshold to whatever you feel comfortable at, but like 
that information harvesting is, is one thing. But then the other thing, because knowing that it's so hard to pull your child back from like a, an environment that is compelling him to go do the stuff, right? It's like win the games, you know, do the stuff because you are at the end of the day, like if you're, if your kid is like getting pretty serious about this, like they're competitive, they want right. to play it. They like the game. Like th that's they're important. Not, yeah. They're not interested in like showing up to a tournament to not play, right. you know, like that's what, what's the point. Right. Uh, and so I think that's where environment matters where it's like, yeah, look like it's just better. I think to, to find a place where you don't get nudged in the direction that's like, you're not like constantly redlining, like marginally unsafe decisions that instead the environment is like, Hey, we're more interested in promoting like a healthier culture around that. And, and that's, uh, you know, one, one thing that I'll say about our Academy is that like, that's, that's what, I, what we try to do. Cause it's what we believe, but also there are, there are definitely places around the country that also believe a lot of the same stuff. Um, the challenge is that you just, you get penalized, right? Cause like, if you believe that, then you're not trying to win tournaments all the time, which means you won't <laughs> like, if you're right. not, if you're not trying to win the tournament, like you're not gonna, uh, cause there's like a bunch of other people there that are trying to win. And so they're gonna, uh, and so, you know, that, that just means like searching out places that maybe are not like, you know, we've won back to back to back Florida state titles or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, just, something to something to think about as as you're trying to trying to navigate a lot of this stuff yeah i think a, an important part of where that that like facilitator like who you're going to to get this information make these coaching decisions is really important because like you said like the not sticking the the fork in the the outlet like that kind of parental energy is significant and i think that that's where having the right coach the right academy whoever it is that's making the decision like that way the parent isn't the one having to be like pulling their kid off the field, hundred percent, right? It's that they can say, cause the kid wants to compete, wants to go out there, that that's, that's the conversation between the coach and the kid who their job isn't to be always loving and nurturing. It's to be the, the right steward to that kid's progress towards their goals. That's right. And so they get to make decisions exclusively around that. So that way, when that kid gets in the car, the person driving them home, isn't who they're pissed at. Like they, they have the person in their life that's responsible for those decisions. And that's what they're, that's what they're at. They can say, sorry, Co like coach Mike knows what he's talking about. He, he's the, he's the one who calls the shots. That's right. That's right. I'm curious. I'm curious about, uh, you know, as, as we, as we think through some of the, you know, the environmental factors and, and things like, how, how do you see that translating to the like pro and an elite, uh, group where it's like, it looked like you, to your point, like you, you're gonna throw today. Like, you know, that's it. Like you're gonna throw, this is, this is what the schedule is. You know, it's 162 games and it's 154 games. It's, it's whatever, right? Like you're gonna throw. So how do you see navigating a lot of that stuff in, in that environment? Like what are the tools that you've been deploying? Yeah, it's, it's the same kind of question of like the different information sources. It's just the the goal that they're applied for is is different because it's no longer um, should I throw today or should should the athlete throw today? It's he's throwing today. What does he need to do to be as optimally prepared and ready for that? So from from my perspective, that's as many informational sources as possible, whether that's biometric data, um, subjective feedback, like how'd you sleep? How do you feel um, like you have trouble falling asleep? Did you feel energized going into pregame? like the, the subjective things that um, some of the objective measures might miss. And then also just like grounding the, the objective measures to, to how the athletes actually perceiving it. And then things like jump testing, where we're able to get um, a sense of their, their physical capacity that day mm -hmm. in a, in a general way. Whereas like the specific, you can't, you're not going to like throw a bullpen in the morning to find out if you can throw hard today to see if you could throw in the evening. Right. But having something that's non-invasive, low tax, like, wear an aura and do some jumps. Now you can, you can base your performance in those jumps and your, your biometric, um, readiness off of like baselines and see I'm at this point today. I know I'm going to likely throw later. Here's how I can modify my lift. So as a trainer working with these athletes, 
whatever pieces of information they have available gets layered in as context to making those decisions um, for lifting based on things like a tier system where if athletes are, if we say like three components, like biometric data, subjective feedback, and jump performance. If they're at, if those three things, we just rank them out of five and it adds up to 15, this guy's feeling great. He's going to do a full lift today. If that adds up to six, he's not lifting today and he needs to go see a trainer. And anywhere between that, we can scale back the volume and intensity of the other stuff, knowing that we, we don't get to choose what's happening in the game. We can adjust the rest of the training economy because that game performance is still is one chunk of the, the training economy. Yep, It's going to be most of it in the season. It's the most important thing, especially at the professional level. Um, that's what guys are getting paid to do. And if they do well, they're going to get to pay to do it longer. Yep. Teams are going to win. Everybody's going to be happy. Um, so that part we don't have as much control over or we have none if we're the, the private organization advising these guys. Right. Um, but the, the other 20, 40, 60% of their day, depending on if they're starter reliever position player, whatever it is, we can balance the rest of that training economy, knowing, um, that the, the other side, the in-game side might be spiking. So we might not get to control like the, the acute to chronic ratio of their, their in-game pitches, but we can take a look at their whole workload and drop their tonnage down a little bit in the weight room. We can drop their their intensity in the weight room, add some reps in reserve, do things like that, so that the the specific system, the throwing, might we might not again might not be able to change, but the the general systems that are going into it, we can make sure that we're we're giving as much margin as possible, um, or pushing it where we can. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> at the pro level, you know, when you're using those systems, we had a lot of success um, using Pulse with the Reds. It, Shout out Brian Conger, who really did all the work um, because we oriented it around performance, not health. You know, that was the biggest thing, biggest success we had. Um, it was like, we have this amount of throws, this capacity allows you to do other things. And uh, Conger would always push that. I didn't quite understand where he was going with it. And it took me a while to understand where he was going with it. Um, but at the end of the year, our low A team and the high A team to some degree, but really um, it was both, actually both those equally at the end of the year. Um, our relievers threw off the mound every single day, six days a week. Uh, and sometimes on the off day, they would throw off the mound. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing to watch because they would post our coach at high A, like Brian Garman, you know, or at low A, Forrest Herman. They would just post the pulse dashboard and be like, here's the values in the green, yellow, red, et cetera. And, you know, the first half of the season, you have to educate them, tell them what it is. And we don't, we don't pull any of the throwing back. Like, that's what a lot of orgs have done and have been scarred by it, as we've talked about. Sure. Um, we just said, like, hey, this education is throwing, blah, blah. And if they exceeded, okay, we understand that there's the risk that they've exceeded their throws. But the parenting, you know, don't throw anymore. That damage is way worse than, like, the very slight increase of risk. So you can't do that, knowing that that's way worse, right? And, so that's, and, yeah. And that's, so, you know, they were able to throw off the mound. And they would be like, they would throw three pitches off the mound and be like, no, I'm good. You know, when I went to our uh, adult league signee, we signed a guy out of adult league. You know, he threw. And they would instinctively save 10 throws from long toss and weighted ball work mm -hmm. to go on there on the mound. Then we had the most non-drafted free agents at a ball out of any organization. And our performance was better than anyone else because mm -hmm. those, and I really attribute it to them throwing off the mound all the time. And they got so much better command stuff, attacking the hitters. Um, because a lot of times they went to a small division two, II, division three, or a small D one school, and they maybe didn't get a lot of playing opportunities or they never didn't get to compete against extremely high level talent. So they had to learn on the job too. So mm -hmm. then the constant reps on the mound, their constant built confidence and, and the stuff and everything else that went into it. And it was such a inspiring way to think about, wow, we can use these monitoring tools to get better at our job, not to uh, maybe not get hurt, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a two, a sort of a, I had a question that, that came up while, while both of you were, were talking, which is like the, <clears throat> the big complaint or, or like the, the big issue is, is like one, I don't want to feel like you're taking something away from me or, or number two, like put a different way. Like I've heard people like, you know, describe it as like uh, monitoring anxiety or whatever, where it's like, Oh, my score flashes red. Therefore I'm bad. Therefore I'm going to be bad today. And then that itself creating like this issue. And, and I'm curious, like how, how you guys both think of this issue of like, not not just but like false positives like just because it flashes red we actually don't know if you're going to pr that day or not many times people have like flashed 
flashed an absolutely terrible readiness score and like had a great day. Why did that happen? We do not know, you know, but like, I'm curious how you, you manage that either like internally in our system, if you want to handle it from like a technical perspective or just like how we teach guys how to, how to think about this stuff. I'm going to give it a chess analogy. So you go first. Sweet. My, yeah. <laughs> my, mine's less relevant than yours. So. Okay. I think, I think the, the two, like how we address it and the, the educational piece is like kind of one in the same where it's understanding that those, those scores, that, that feedback is not necessarily, it's not how you're going to perform today. It's how ready are you for how you're going to perform today? Mm -hmm. So your, your performance can be however, um, but your, your response is going to change depending on um, your, your physiological readiness that day. So you could feel like crap and we've all can think of, I'm sure plenty of stories of guys showing up hungover or whatever and going four for four. Right. right. Um, but the, the training response that the, that that stimulus elicits is going to be different depending on how they were going into that. And there's so many factors, like you said, right? Like we, we can measure things like the comp scores and the mocap expected velo from the force plates. You put those things together, the R squared isn't 1.0, right? Like there, there's other factors that go into something uh, as complex that happens as fast with as many segments involved as throwing or hitting a baseball, even if it's not in a game, much, much more so in a game with the, mm -hmm. all the competitive factors. Right. Um, so it's not necessarily like, Hey, you're in the red. Don't do this. It's understanding that you're in the red means we have about this much in the tank. And so then working around what you do today and the following, is the response there. So it might not mean any change in that day's plan. If they're, they're in the yellow or whatever, it might mean that how we're going to approach the next few days, it might just be more of a structured check-in on how they're feeling the next day or the day after that. It might mean engaging the, the time between outings or high intensity days changes. And it could just be for the, the fact of tracking the two in parallel and mm -hmm. seeing how does the, the increased stimulus affect the, the, the output measures. Like we, we track the inputs, the, how much weight they're moving, how many throws they're making, the velocity of those throws. Uh, we have the, the pulse measures, radar measure, measures. Um, and, and so we can see the, the training inputs and then the outputs in things like the, the biometrics and the jump testing, the things that are telling us like, how's the body responding to these, these stressors? Um, it might not even need to change the training inputs at all. It might just be understanding like um, this athlete's stress recovery adaptation, we need to be giving him more time in between, he might be able to handle even shorter. We might be able to have this guy um, doing doing more high intense sessions per week. It, it's more about, um, there's like the micro, like this is how it affects your day. And then the macro, uh, this is us understanding you better as an athlete and how to train you better. Mm -hmm. And I think like the the micro is where like the that gamification comes in. Like you wanna sleep better, you get more green lights, you feel better for your training. But the, the macro is where a lot of those, those insights and understanding the athletes and when to deload, when to push the envelope, um, when they're primed for peak performance, like all those things, um, that's where, like, that's where the real insights come from is from that macro. And that has no, no bearing on, on pushing them, um, or pulling them back off out of the, the competitive settings. It's understanding them, using it to understand them better as an athlete. Yeah. When I see those numbers right now, I'm, I'm in the adequate to limited band in aura. It's not good. You know, <laughs> um, it, it's exactly the response. I understand that those numbers are systemic, right? I, I know that when my diet's dialed, I sleep more. Um, I'm not traveling. And when I, you know, we use cold tub and whatever, like I know these things have like positive impacts on my recovery. So I don't take the numbers like, well, today, this is what I can do. It's like, well, it, it makes me honest with myself. It's like, well, am I really trying to be at the best mental health or the best thing for my job and my, my hobby, which is playing chess? Well, apparently not. Right. It's, it's giving me honesty as Casey Williams would say, Yeah, you know, um, and then I can perform well in any given chess game. You know, that's my serious hobby these days. Um, but I probably have to take more caffeine. I have to have a coffee. I have to do less before the game. I have to, in the game, I have to intentionally extremely focus for four hours and that's very tiring, which means the next day is going to be really, my response is going to be terrible. You know, whereas if my readiness is good, I go in, I don't have to think, I don't have to engage my brain. Like a lot of the moves flow naturally. Right. Um, but I can get the same level of performance, but just not week after week after week. Like the, the amount of focus and intensity that is required to get that performance over taxes, my, my response. And then the next day is going to be recovery, whether I plan it or not, like it's just purely going to be that mm -hmm. way. Whereas 
that that's not the case when my readiness is, is dialed in. So that's, I think the response is the best way to look at it because we all, the anxiety is real. You, lo you look at this and, oh, I can't do this. I sent my bench, I set um, my bench PR on uh, when I was wearing whoop on one of my worst whoop days. You know, I slept 12 hours, drank a ton of water, did whatever, did my activation. My whoop score was terrible. And I was still able to bench, you know, 450 like that day. It was like, it was, I was like dialed in that day. All right, 450 was, a, it was wrong. It was, <laughs> it was like 360 or something. But it's like, it's, I recognize that it's not a one day thing. Right? Sure. Um, so that's the best way to think about it. What's, what's, uh, I guess just, just wrap, wrapping this up, but like, we've invested a lot of time, money and energy into this. Other people have as well. You got major league baseball, you know, funding the entire pitch Mart initiative. You have people writing books on the subject for years and years and years. And it's just, it's just not fixed. So like, why is that? Well, one is the problem fixable, which is no, right? Like it's not fixable. Um, it's not solvable. That's for sure. Because, you mean like across the industry or like for any individual pitcher across the, across any sport, right? Like concussions, ACL tears, all these other things in every sport. It's not possible because we're pushing the limits of human performance. It's what fans want to watch. They want to watch the greatest athletes do the greatest stuff in the world. Sure. Uh, and then that means that at any level of sport, we incur a larger injury risk. That's just how it is. Um, if the idea was like, well, the best way to get outs was to have precision command and not throw really hard, I think the injuries would still be significant because the amount of training time that would require to get the command as good as Trevor Williams would be so much, you know, so you're still going to or have even like three times as good. Like if you truly yeah. want to think about right. command as like a weapon, it's right. like, all right, yeah, you're throwing it through a toilet paper roll. Like, right. So you're looking at this game and you're like, oh, we'll 10. see, there's not that much risk. It's like, but you know how much work had to go into that to him for his command to be that good? You know, it's like, yeah, if you don't naturally have it, like it's still you're incurring a huge amount of tonnage at that point. You know, maybe it's not intensity, but sure. volume. Uh, so there's that. We have to be honest with like, yeah, I mean, look at, look at Japan. Like yep. that, that was the, that's the dominant training paradigm or, read has, the, or has been. Read the arm. That's <laughs> right. More information and, and it's just like, yeah. They, they have injuries over there that we should. never have in America. You know, it's like crazy injuries, like the yeah, necro and, necrosis and of the bone. Very, and all that other very stuff. young ages. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they don't tear their UCLs at young ages. I don't get into the gory details. Read the book if you want. Um, so it's, it's a, uh, but the question is still valid. You know, I don't want to dismiss it. We do need to do better. And the solution is going to be multimodal. Go back to the beginning. It's going to be synthesizing um, readiness scores. I've, I very, very firmly believe, and I know Whitey believes this too, uh, is that there has to be a readiness score, sleep track. There has to be an easy way to do it or a whoop, whatever it is. Uh, there's a lot of other competitors coming on the market with open data, which is great. Um, and sticking with it and synthesizing it and, and factoring that in, so there has to be a readiness overall preparedness. That's like whatever you want to call that readiness, uh, you know, mental fatigue, et cetera. That has to be measured somehow. Then there has to be some form of movement, you know, sport specific. So that is biomechanics scores, comp scores, improving those things in ways that we can. Uh, that's the micro. The macro is the workload tracking, right? Mm -hmm. The long-term development. And then the general physical preparedness was the jumping, the, you know, the, what we see in high performance and strength and conditioning, it's going to be multimodal right now. In many ways, we treat it uh, by, by many ways. I mean, all, all places I've seen treats it as siloed things. Right. And even at driveline, we're not perfect about it, but there's going to be that multimodal algorithm that's going to get us those comp scores closer and closer and closer. Uh, and then there's a paradigm shift on the biomechanics side <clears throat> in Ford dynamics, which we're not going to talk about now. Um, but just there's more and more technology coming online like DEXA, uh, which Whitey knows a lot about getting segment lengths, calibrating things, actual like actual precision understanding of the muscle fibers that are going on. And again, these are really expensive and they say, oh, well, my 11 year old is never going to do this. It's like, no, it's not about your 11 year old now. It's about the one year old. 10 years from now, who will be 11 years old. Those will be distilled into cheaper algorithms, cheaper machines that we can figure out. And Driveline is possibly not possible. It is the only organization that's not at the professional level that is driving that type of research to then distill down to the consumer. But that can be very frustrating if you're a parent and you don't live in Seattle or Phoenix or Tampa and you see like, oh, they have all those cool things, but I live in Topeka, Kansas. It's like, well, the flex plan is extremely good and we're going to distill that all. We're going to distill down our awesome models into the next best thing. So when you are ready to make the pilgrimage, you've had trained for five years on our remote training platform. And that's our vision. And there's no question that we're going to be the only place. And I'll be, I'll be so 
confident <clears throat> and arrogant to say we're the only people that are going to deliver on it. We're the only ones that can because we're the only ones that have been researching to this level. Um, and I'm excited about it. So, you know, what, what, what do you want to add anything to that, Whitey, as far as like what we're trying to do there? No, I think that the the that in, in addition with how I mentioned what we've currently done in terms of tracking like workloads, uh, biometric jump things in parallel like that to see how they go together. Um, and I think that when you talk about distilling it down, um, if we're thinking about it like, oh, it's coming down from the gold standard, it's coming up from zero. Um, oh, that's a good way to say like, that. I think that if we're the base rate fallacy, yeah, yeah, if we're if we're going, if our goal is to, to fix it, to solve it, right? Like the the goal is if it's target zero elbow injuries um, across across the United States, the 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 mechanism or the the actual objective is like as close to that as possible approaching zero mm -hmm. um and so the the incremental progress is what matters the most and the incremental of going from uh it might not be the the 100 gold standard it has dexa underlying physical structures paired with um tracking in a motion capture lab if we have say the computer vision some kind of something that we can base off workload information whatever that is even if it's 50 percent is accurate that that jump from zero to there is so significant and like those are the steps that that gets you on the the right part of that that curve approaching zero up from zero yeah that's a great way to think about it that is a great way to think about it